Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I'm happy everybody has come out to hear my talk. I hope you won't throw things at me if you disagree with me, but I'm very happy to take questions or stop me at any time. I actually don't even know how long this talk is supposed to be. How long is my? OK, so you'll have to be bringing in dinner or something, I'm afraid, because I don't stop. I'm warning you. So no, really, how long should I? 5.30? Um, evolution and morality. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite topics, or <laughs> bringing things together from biology and philosophy. Uh, it's, I like that idea. So what can we say? Well, first of all, if you're interested in more, this is a book I did last year, uh, Bounds of Reason. It's much, very much for, it, it's, it's got a lot of math, but it's also got a lot of sociology and modal logic and all sorts of really neat stuff. So it's fun if you don't mind the math. This is a book Sam Bowles and I, who've been working together, I don't know, forever, um, just finished. And it's a rather um, interdisciplinary treatment of the question, why, how, why are, how, how did hu humans get to be so cooperative? Cooperative in the sense that we work together um, uh, uh, in ways that are productive, that, uh, are rather unique in the realm of biology. Uh, and if you want to learn game theory, this is the best book to learn game theory. <laughs> it is. It's just all I can say. It's got a lot of problems. When you learn math, there's only one way to learn math and physics, and that's do a lot of problems. Okay. So this will help that. But at any rate, here is where, here's how I learned about um, morality and human nature. Some people don't like to use the term human nature, but it seems to me extremely appropriate, and uh, I will use it ad libitum. Here's what I learned. Evolution gave humans large brains. Brain is empty at birth. This is John Locke's so-called tabula rasa, or blank slate. The brain is filled with culture, including moral principles. So when you're young, they open it up and they pour in all this culture, you know, and they close it up again. And then you're an adult. So everything in your brain that has to do with culture comes from it having been transmitted to you uh, from people in your generation, your parents, schools, churches, etc. And this includes moral principles. The, the idea is that at birth, you have no moral principles. You learn all your moral principles. The interesting part of that is, if you, could, if you have to learn all your moral principles, then there shouldn't be any particular pattern of moral principles that humans have. In different societies, just like you learn different languages, you'd learn different moral principles. There would be no communality among humans as to the moral principles, because they're just culture. They're just learned. Things that some society thinks are wonderful, other societies will recall in horror. Uh, human society equals big brain plus culture. We don't need evolution or evolutionary theory or anything biological or anything wet, like cells, DNA, genes. We don't need any meat. We just need big brain plus culture. Um, and when I started working in this area, a lot of people were very angry at me for trying to relate evolution and biology to culture because they said, well, this leads to Hitler and Stalin and, you know. <laughs> all the bad people. Republicans, who knows? <laughs> Horrible stuff. But I persisted. I could care less. Evolutionary theory is irrelevant to the study of human society because culture and morality have nothing to do with evolution. There's a wonderful movie, by the way, by, let's see, Catherine Hepburn is in it, and um, Humphrey Bogart's called 
African queen. And uh, Humphrey Bogart says at one point, well, she, she says something or other. And he says, well, you know, it's just human nature. And she says, human nature, Mr. Albrecht, is what God put, on us, put us on earth to overcome. <laughs> right? And this, it's this feeling that like we are born red in tooth and claw, you know, without any morality. We're savage. And everything we have in the way of morality comes from pour it in. Close it up. Here's a, this is one of my favorite quotes. It comes from a really great political philosopher. The state of men without civil society, and as you know, in those days, men meant men and women. Didn't mean men versus women. Which may be called the state of nature. And by the way, by civil society, he means a society with private property, with institutions like legal institutions, police, jails, and an executive like a king or uh, something, anything, a, a, a real um, institutional government. That's civil society. The state of men without civil society, which may be called the state of nature, is nothing but a war of all against all where every man is enemy to every man. The life of man is solitary, poor, brutish, nasty, and, thank God, short. <laughs> right? And this is Thomas Hobbes. Now, there was some disagreement with Thomas Hobbes. Um, Locke disagreed. He said that in the state of nature, the only thing he disagreed with was he thought that property rights existed in the state of nature. But this is a, an academic point. There are two, two really things going on here. One is, before we had civil society, human beings lived just in an awful, horrible state of nature where they hated each other and they fought all the time and there was no such thing as morality or civility or any of that stuff. Now, we know now, and he didn't really know this, but we know now that human beings have lived in this so-called state of nature for at least... 90% uh, of our existence as a species, probably 95%. So all of our genes developed in this so-called state of nature, which means that we, do, if he were right, we have developed all of our, all of our genetic development occurred prior to any civil society. And that would reinforce the idea that all of our morality must come from civil society. But it also means that there, the humans, for most of our existence, just were totally immoral. They used to call they used to call them savages. We don't use the term savage anymore. But the idea was they're below. They don't have a morality. Well, that turns out not to be true. Now, I can't go through with you the various ways we know it's not true. I, I would say the main one is the main two are first of all, we can we can dig up the remains of people and we see how they lived, and we see that they buried their they buried people uh, after death, that they took care of, 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 of their own, even if they were um, uh, handicapped. People, uh, there are people who have lived to old age even though they were severely handicapped. They must have been helped by others. We know in a lot of ways that it's unlikely that they, were, uh, that, that they had that uh, absolute lack of morality. But we also know because there are today, there are at least a, a thousand existing hunter-gatherer societies that in many ways are just like our whole species existed up to 10,000 years ago, even 8,000 years ago. Um, and if you go to those societies, they're very different from our society, but they're extremely human. They have very complex languages, they love music, and they make art and they philosophize, and uh, they are as intelligent as you and me, and they are considered, they, they care about morality a whole lot. So the idea that you have to have a king or you have to have a church telling you um, what's good and what's bad um, before you can get morality, well, it's just not the case. By the way, they have no churches, they have no teachers, Oh, et cetera. And nevertheless, they, they, you would understand immediately their morality and they would understand yours. They might not agree with everything that you, that you believe, but mostly they would agree with it. 
At any rate, we know this now. We did not know this then. But this is now I'm going to move closer to just several years ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago. Here's another. This is from, this is from biology. We are survival machines, robots, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. And this is, a, again, I don't mean to criticize the guy. This is a very famous and brilliant man. He just happens to be quite wrong about this, as far as I, as I will argue. This is the book, The Selfish Gene, which is well worth reading. He made a mistake in extending all of his beautiful theory to humans um, and, and other social species. I'll give a couple more quickly. Um, this is economics. The first principle of economics is that every agent is actuated only by self-interest. Francis Ysidro Edgeworth. The, if you study economics, you'll get the Edgeworth box, so-called Edgeworth box. And uh, he was quite a brilliant economist. And by the way, he said, the next sentence after this, I don't have it, the next sentence is, he says, of course this is not true, that people are all self-interested. But for economics purposes, it's good enough. We don't need anything else. And that turns out, uh, this is just an aside. Let me just tell you, as an aside, this is not true. Now we know that there's a deep morality associated with market economies. And if you have the markets, but you don't have the morality, you get rogue states, like the Soviet Union, like Russia, I'm sorry, like Russia now, or like many um, third world underdeveloped countries with predatory states and corrupt uh, corrupt uh, economies. The, the hard part of economic development is moral development. <laughs> it may sound strange, but it's true. Um, human nature is, so here, if, uh, I'll give you, I, I'm going to move on quickly. So I want to say, here's the last one. This is a friend of mine. He's, he said this in, a long time ago. He no longer agrees with it. But here's how strongly people felt about this, say, in 1975. No hint of genuine charity ameliorates our vision of society. One sentimentalism has been laid aside. What passes for cooperation turns out to be a mixture of opportunism and exploitation. Scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. <laughs> Anybody who claims he's an altruist is a hypocrite. Okay, you help a little old lady across the street, you'll find out there's something in it for him. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Or else he's stupid. Just made a mistake. He thought he'd get something out of it. Maybe he thought it was his grandmother. Who knows? He couldn't have done it just out of the good goodness of his heart. Because we don't have any goodness in our heart. <laughs> At any rate, that's what he means by scratch an altruist and, and, and watch a hypocrite bleed. And this is Michael Gislin, The Economy of Nature and the Evolution of Sex. Um, 